Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare Conversations About Horror. I am, as I usually am, Catherine Troyer, and I am delighted to be joined by someone who I'm always delighted to be joined by, and that is Anthony Tresca. Well, hello there. This is a podcast where the horrifically nerdy meets the terrifyingly academic, as we explore that fine line between the horrific and just the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are so excited to have you join us today for our episode over 2009's Jennifer's Body. Body is a, a slightly peculiar film in a lot of respects, right? It's peculiar both in terms of content, but but before we even get into to the film itself or get into some of the scholarship on the film, um, like just the film's journey and existence is also rather peculiar. Yeah, this film, I mean, in the 12 years since it's been released in 2009, which I guess is explicitly dating this episode, but... Uh... I guess and we're not also really trying to hide that it's we're recording this in 2021 but so we're talking that's where we're talking about it Jennifer's legacy in this 12 years uh it's kind when it first premiered uh the ad campaign was kind of really infamous at the time it was really sexualized and really targeted at a very specific demographic it was very clearly targeted at, at like the young male demographic who I mean, according to what box office tells us and what has been a lot of just like anecdotally kind of accepted as fact, horror audiences skew more male. Uh, And so in that long line of tradition, they advertise this movie very directly at the young male audience, really playing up Megan Fox's role and her and really objectifying her. Uh, Did you see the trailers or things? Do you remember this? I'm sure I did. I don't remember them, but I don't not remember them, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, but I I do vaguely remember, actually what I distinctly remember is walking out of the film and not really having enjoyed it because it wasn't what I'd been set up to see, right? Which is what you're talking about. So here's the thing. We have a female writer, we have a female director, and we have two female leads. Yeah. Everyone else in the film is, is underdeveloped male characters, right? Um, This is not a film really meant for the the demographic that they targeted at and i would truly think it's because in 2009 you know we hadn't hit that that renaissance of horror that people like peel have allowed us to enter right so now studios like a24 um and and people and and blumhouse right Mm -hmm. allowing people like jordan peel to make films we've begun to realize oh yeah horror can be more than just titillating um things for you know 18 to 22 year old men to watch when they can't watch porn, right? Like we've, yeah. we've come to that epiphany as, as studios, right? I think fans were aware of that, but studios have come to that realization. And I, it would be so interesting to see how successful this film would have done from the beginning if it had been released now, because the truth is it's very popular. Now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the, so it bombed at the box office though. Uh, when it came out, and it was also, not only was it bombed in terms of, like, financially viewed as a failure, but critics were kind of brutal on this film when it came out. It was, it got a, it had a rotten, it still has a rotten tomato on the rotten, on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, and critics are just kind of really mean, like, just calling it trashy, empty B-movie with delusions of grandeur. Uh, that's a summation of a lot of them. Like, uh, the Chicago... Tr- Tribune was like a gruesome paint by numbers succubus story. So just really kind of like knocking it down at the time with, and the rare reviews that were out there uh, were just kind of like, it's fun trash. So even the positive reviews were still kind of like a backhanded compliment. However, that is not the same today. It has come back in a very real way. And as talked about in 20, uh, 2018 Vox article by Constance Grady, which kind of like do- documented this transition from 
Jennifer's body to a flop in 2009 to becoming a kind of held as a cult classic today. Uh, and they kind of talk about how this film has been recontextualized in the Me Too era that and this awakening that's kind of happened, this reckoning that we've had particularly around uh, sexual assault and violence against women, which does play a huge part in this film, and how those events have allowed the film to be recontextualized from a sex fantasy to a rape revenge uh, fantasy, which is a common horror subgenre. Uh, and yeah, so it's kind of been held up now. It's went completely around from the reception where it was like being panned to now it's being held up as a feminist cult classic. And that's where we sit today in 2021. Honestly, this film had a, had a lot of um, just strikes against it from the start, right? So there's there were going to be a lot of expectations for this film to do an awful lot because Diablo Cody, our a screenwriter, had just come off of winning an Academy Award for Juno. Yep. Um, and, you know, Juno is also a quirky, offbeat film. It really is the, the sort of rom-com version of um, Jennifer's body because it doesn't fit into any neat holes. You're not going to get the the things that you want or expect to happen from the Hollywood uh, formula. You don't get any of that stuff in Juno and you don't really get any of that stuff in, Ju in Jennifer's body. But the problem was is that they knew how to market Juno and they didn't know how to market Jennifer's body. Yeah. We also have to remember that this is like around the Transformers era of um, Megan Fox's yep. career. Yep. Where she was explicitly, you know, sold as, as the, the like, she, all she could be was the male gaze fantasy. Um, and suddenly we have a film where the only gaze staring at Jennifer's body is female, right? Because it's the character of Needy. So we have that going against it um, in terms of like this initial reception. Again, I think we just have the problems of like horror not being understood as being able to be more. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important you said it, but I think as we're saying again, that, that this film has um, become, I think, more culturally relevant in the Me Too movement. And not just in terms of Me Too for the characters, but also for, for Megan Fox, right? Um, you know, the way that we treat culturally Megan Fox today, um, or Britney Spears, or, or all of the, right, several of these uh, female celebrities, is very different than we, how we treated them um, in 2009. And so we can see this film as being, it can be playful and, and have our actress still be a strong feminist, right? Um, we've kind of expanded our understandings of things. Uh, and I'm going to make the bold, maybe it's not bold. I don't know if it's bold. Just make the claim. What's the claim? How bold is it? Tell it to us. <laughs> it may not be bold, but I feel like all cult classics are inherently messy and not necessarily all that perfect right like i'm thinking of like all the the films that have engendered cult classic status like rocky horror picture show um of course and and it's rocky horror is not it's not necessarily good right it's not great not as not as an artifact unto itself it's all the the layers and additions and add-ons and, and i think jennifer's body is a really fascinating film but it's not a great film in, in many respects. Um, I would like to say clearly, it sounds like you have never talked to a fan of either of these yeah, properties because I know. their definitions of good uh, are vastly different than I think the ones that you are using because Die Hard, I watched a, a little bit about my watching of Jennifer's Body this time. I rewatched it. This is not my first time seeing Jennifer's Body. I Me saw either. Jennifer's Body like, I guess when I was probably like 13 or something, I was, and I was like, ooh, we're, <laughs> we're, so we're watching a spooky movie. That's Demon. right. Demon. And then it wasn't even that spooky, even when I was 13. But, uh, and then I rewatched it again when I came to college. And then now I've rewatched it with a rowdy group of people who love this movie. And it, I, it, it added to my experience of rewatching the film, certainly. The, just the, the experience that, it com that it, uh, comes around watching it with a group of people who just love it. The quotes, the one-liners, the campy aesthetic, just the whole production yeah. of it. So this is, this is at least my third time watching it. So the first time, like I said, I watched it in theaters and I didn't really care for it because it wasn't what I'd been going to see, right? And, and I am, for better or worse, one of those viewers that... Um, 
if I have preconceived notions, which is why I don't watch trailers anymore, right? If I have preconceived notions um, and they don't meet it, it doesn't matter if it's a good film. It's hard for me to reconcile the two. Um, But I will tell you, every time I've watched it since, for the last two times in particular, I have liked it better than I did the previous time. I thought it was smarter and, and more clever and funnier. I just think that by definition, part of what makes cult classic films classics um, is that they are messy, right? And I mean that as I've as I've indicated in previous episodes, I mean that in a really positive way. But I think there are some, as we will talk about, problematic aspects to this film. And that brings us to. Uh, and did you, did you catch the segue I'm about to do right now? Yeah, yeah, I thought that, that was clever. This brings us to our theory for the day. We're going to get into some of the messier aspects of Jennifer's body. We're going to think theoretically about it. So why don't you why don't you tell our listeners, what's the theory on Jennifer's body? Yeah, so considering that this is a film that, that relatively speaking is not that old, um, I realize, you know, we are 21 and it was 2009 and so I always have to remind myself that's more time than I thought it was but it's not as old as say a film from like the 70s right um so considering that it's not that old of a film um and considering that it's it's only had a sort of resurgent for its resurgence for the last little while there is actually quite a bit that has been written on Jennifer's body um because it lends itself so perfectly to some existing um frameworks, frameworks that we've brought into this before. So I, I want to throw um, sort of like shout out to, there's a lovely article by uh, the primary lead's last name is Chesna, um, and where they're looking at this film through the monstrous feminine, uh, which comes to us from Creed, Barbara Creed, who we've mentioned before. They're looking at the abject, which we've talked about in terms of uh Kristeva before um and I've also seen readings about it with with um Carol Clover and sort of the slasher film Mm -hmm. so one of the nice things about Jennifer's body is that it works really well for discussions of existing scholarship but the article I want to talk about that really sort of changed how I was thinking about this this film um is by a gentleman whose name is Ben Koyman uh or Kuman I'm not really sure which and he has an article called Whose Body a tourism, feminism, and horror in Hostel Part Two in Jennifer's Body. So, um, Kuman is looking at Eli Roth in who is Hostel Part Two mm-hmm. and, and Diablo Cody in particular for Jennifer's Body. Who is the writer for Jennifer's Body? Who's the body. writer? And we have a female director um, for that film as well. And and basically, what Kuman is saying is that there was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of of pushback to this idea that these two films were, were feminist. Um, and he says there's a number of, of really important reasons for considering that. And that is, that's, that's interesting. That's an interesting claim because it flies directly in the face of the kind of like narrative that has been built up around the film, at least since 2018 in particular, of being this really solid like feminist masterpiece. Right, and so this actually is kind of what, what Kuman is talking about, is he's saying that Cody and Roth both explicitly are have articulated that their respective films are feminist texts right that they are purposefully um creating it as such but what kuman does is he shows us there's a lot of scholars out there who are saying things like um kelsey wallace who called the film quote another attempt by hollywood to punish women for liking sex by turning them into demons putting them into insane asylums and murdering them um, and then he, he juxtaposes that with Cody saying, we wanted to put these feminist bits in there. We're really interested in that. And so Quayman says that that what makes this so tricky, and he references um, another scholar named Scarlett Scribe, is that there's sort of this opposing logic at work. So um, this, this is a quote from Scarlett Scribe. Feminist A might say, Jennifer has to rely on men for her continued well-being and becomes ugly when she doesn't. How can a woman relying upon a man be construed as feminist? Feminist B might say, Jennifer eats boys to remain the woman she wants to be. It's about time a woman uses a man for her purposes. How can that not be feminist? Right. So there's mm-hmm. some some really important tensions. In, and he, um, Quayman argues this is true for, for Roth's Hostel Part 2 as well. Oh, yeah. But what what I find really interesting um, about about Quayman's article, because this is not the type of scholarship I tend to do, is that he's also talking about the the directors. And so auteurism is this idea that we've we've kind of come to 
to see this as being not not always the way it is in film, but it's the idea that like you can there are certain auteurs or authors of film that we can say this is a Hitchcock film. Sure, other people were involved, but this is a Hitchcock film or a Jordan Peele film or a Darren Aronofsky film, right? And um, <laughs> that that what happens when we when we make these associations, right, is that we are linking a text not just to um, the things that are happening in the narrative, but to the persona created by by the auteur. So Hitchcock was a famous a famous um, misogynist, and it's not hard to read a lot of those themes in his texts. Um, Eli course. Roth is kind of presented as this like gore hound, um, you know, bros bro, and so how could he possibly create a feminist text? And for Diablo Cody, um, the fact that she was a stripper. Um, and, and, ha and is explicitly open about her life as such and has made it very clear that she has, um, you know, that Diablo Cody is her stage name, like that this is part of who she is. A lot of people have said, oh, well, then she can't possibly be a feminist if she's part of this, you know, thing that we have decided is not feminist. And therefore, anything she produces can't possibly be feminist because you can't make something feminist if you're not feminist, right? And it's a really, like, that's a intriguing arguments make and I, I i personally don't agree with it um in, in either case right i think that you can be multiple things at once i think it's also possible that a film can be more and better than you the individual i think it's actually what why we are having problems right now with like joss whedon and separating his ickiness as a human with uh, our appreciation of his text like i think we should do away with auteurism i will flat out say it it's difficult for to to get into any property if you're uh, without talking about it to some extent though it's like this it's it the is. tricky issue of not being always able to separate the art from the artist at a certain point you have to acknowledge that the art you're watching didn't just spring up out of nowhere it was carefully constructed by individuals it was and it's also you know even as i say that i i want to do away with auteurism as a way of kind of thinking about film I still use it, right, as a shorthand. Right. So a good case in point is, is Ari Aster. Of course, um, of course. You A24, know, baby. Yeah, so <laughs> not only um, have you and I talked about certain, like, cinematic moves he constantly makes, the, the like, around-the-world image, but also I've come to realize what I'm going to get out of a film if it's labeled as an, as an Ari yeah, Aster. Yeah, you know film. it's going to be about family trauma, to some yes. extent, like that is just like that is that is clear. Yes. This guy clearly has some issues he needs to work out, and he's I guess instead of going to a therapist, he's decided he's going to use us as a coping mechanism. Yeah. So that that will do the films that we get, <laughs> right? And and so it becomes a shorthand, right? Like if I tell you, hey, there's a new Ari Aster film, you and I know what we're what we're doing or what we're thinking about already for that film. So it's not that we shouldn't use you know, it as part of the puzzle. But but I think what, what Koyman is pointing out is that when we ask or argue that a film is feminist, the the challenging thing is, is that we're not just talking about narrative. We're talking about where it is in the time in which it was made, who's associated with the project. Um, and then we're adding in the fact that as third wave feminism has proven, there is no one way to be a woman Therefore, there is no single concept of what a feminist text is going to look like. Um, and that's actually, I think, one of the, the more redeeming aspects of Jennifer's body is that, again, if I go back to that word messiness, right, as a text that's kind of messy, you could argue that it is really feminist um, or you could argue that it's problematically feminist. And I, I think I, will, I make both arguments. If you were trying to read it for any serious message, unfortunately, at the core of the movie, it really is just like, Jennifer is using her newfound power that she got from a horrifying sexual assault, um, which that read that deserves further discussion, which I'm sure we'll get to in just a second. But she is just now using this power and kind of just like she is now the one exploiting other people, though. So reading it from more of an intersectional lens, particularly like looking at the cl clear class differences that are present in Jennifer and needy it's not really a super feminist film then because jennifer has just now taken all of the power 
and is now doling it out as she sees fit. She's not actually solved the problem so much as personified the pro problem. And it's it's a kind of like there's Jamel Jamil has, has kind of just gotten to a bit of controversy on Twitter recently. I know I'm bringing in Twitter news now. You know, first time for the podcast because they when, uh, they're an actress. They're on the Good Place, uh, and they were talking about how. You, women using money to acquire more power and independence from men is super liberating and people were t talking about how is it liberating for women to just hoard other money and like just make themselves independently wealthy without doing anything to address the societal problems and so from an intersectional feminist standpoint i don't think there's any way you really could read it as a feminist film textually however right. it's camp so what? Well, okay, so we have to put a pin in camp, right? Because we'll, we we need to spend time on camp. But but before we, do. we get there, we do. I I want to like, I want to pause because what you said was really important, right? Which is that that this text, um, is tricky if we're reading it as a feminist text because the other thing that we didn't talk about, right, um, is the the pseudo lesbian scene, um, between Needy and Jennifer. Um, which there's so much of this film that unfortunately feels like Cody and, and Kusma, who's the, the director, Karen Kusma. they, yeah, they knew, right. That, that they needed to make money off of this film, <laughs> right. They knew they needed to make money off of this film. And that meant that there are moments that kind of feel like they're pandering to their primarily 18 to 22 year old male audience. Um, and I'm not saying that's wrong because again, you have to make money. Um, but, but it means that there are times that you can feel the film wanting to be more than it can be if it's going to be a horror film from 2009. Um, the other thing is, is that Cody brings up a really good point. Uh, this was in an interview, um, recorded in 2009. Uh, and she says, here's a problem that's holding back feminism. And you see it on the blogs. We all hold each other up to an incredibly high standard in a way that men do not. Let's say a woman directs a movie that's not very good. Everybody piles up on her. It's like, no, you're representing us. It has to be perfect. And that's not how it works. Women should be allowed to make bad movies, good movies, porno movies, terrible made for TV movies. And so I think there's something else here, right? That, that you know, because there are still lamentably not enough horror by female horror filmmakers. Anytime a horror film comes out that is by female filmmakers, there's just so much more that's put on them, right? Because the film has to be perfectly feminist. Whereas, you know, a any other horror film can have flaws or quirks, but if it's going to be by a female filmmaker... Or be openly misogynistic as so exactly. much of horror, just like if you read it from, as I just did, with from like purely like what does it say thematically from a textual standpoint? Like, as blatantly misogynistic. This one is not blatantly misogynistic, but but it's still, you're right, it's interesting to think about. It's yet again another one of those tricky aspects of, like, what autorism does is you have to, you have to consider the multiple elements around it and how the reaction to this film and where and the way that we think and talk about it is positioned by the fact that there's female creative team involved. They, it's in, in it, and of those kind of similar factors. Like when it was released at the time of 2009, who they were primarily trying to appeal to. Because although like they talk about that, that kissing scene, for instance, Cody talked about how it's pushed back explicitly against the I, argument that it was just a publicity stunt. Uh, Cody talked about how it was written in the script and like when a male and female character, if they're presenting individuals they're the leads in a horror film and they share an offhand kiss nobody makes a big deal about it the only reason that this got any more attention is because of the attention that was being unfairly put on it because of the male audience and the misogyny that it was pandering to it was yeah. kind of, and kind of forced to pander to in order to try to make a, a profit which is the horrifying truth of it all and and the truth is is that we we look at other films and because there are so many examples of in particular white male characters just across the board in film right we as filmmakers and as audience members don't feel the need 
for this for a single film to act as the representative of of everything that is white male right whereas the truth is is that there are not as many um female characters in horror that are not just the the sex object um there are not as many non-white characters that aren't the sidekick and or someone that dies early and so when we do have films that offer us more um a, an unfair burden is placed on them right um and i think you know you said that that in some ways jennifer's body doesn't read on the surface as as very feminist and and again if you kind of describe it if someone's like what's the film about and you're like a, a woman who you know uses her sex monstrously right that, that doesn't sound very feminist but the truth is this meets the bechdel test so if you um aren't familiar the bechdel test was created um to assess one of the tools to assess how how feminist the text was and, and it said are there multiple women in the film that's that's number one number two do they appear together on the screen at the same time number three do they talk to each other and number four if they do talk to each other do they talk about something other than men and there are tons of films the entire lord of the rings franchise fails this test because although there are strong female characters, they never once talk to each other. Um, this film, Needy and Jennifer, have lots of conversations about their friendship, about what it means to be just teenage girls. That has nothing to do um, with, with boys. And every male character in this film is a shallow, two-dimensional, uh, like, stock male character. The jock, the emo, um, the... <laughs> overly romantic but also underly romantic um high school boyfriend mm -hmm. right like the only developed characters are the female characters so in a lot of respects even on the surface this is a feminist text i i mean it is in the sense that it has it has developed female characters i think i that is i yeah right. so i suppose yes in that sense so we go back to right and, and i'm hearing in your voice but it is admittedly like reservation because I think that's that's what defines this film, right? Is that um, it proves that it's never cut and dry. Um, it's complicated, and and it's not fair to have one work be a stand-in, right, for all of the missed opportunities in horror. Exactly. Um, and, and that's just I, I think the right? reservation you were hearing was me being like. I guess I kind of, like, as you were talking, I was like, does it really even need to be, like, this, like, um, super-duper feminist film in order to be successful? Because it does have these, like, it's exploring a really interesting relationship between these two developed female characters. I'm, like, getting bogged down in the semantics of whether or not it's feminist enough or, is, like, I feel kind of, particularly since the this movie is blatantly kind of a satire it seems almost like you're just this is a self-defeating battle that there is like you're just it seems like a conflict just like exists for no reason i'm like as you were talking that's just like i was like oh does it even matter i completely agree and i think that's why it's so unfortunate that for so long that's all that people wanted to talk about regarding this film yeah right? because there are so many other amazing elements in the film that I feel like, I mean, we even just to some extent just fell trapped to it. Now we spent like 15, 20 minutes talking, talking about this. But there are so many other amazing elements within the film. So I guess let's just use this. This was kind of how we originally planned to open yeah. anyway. So now we finished that conversation. Let's segue into some of the other stuff about the film. So I want to start, because this will lead us to your favorite subject of camp. I want to start um, with something you said about genre so when um i watched this film on hulu this is the most recent time and on hulu it doesn't list it as a horror it, horror film it lists it only as comedy um which is a bold move i probably would have put horror on there's the like second genre yeah um but but this film um in many ways it reminds me a lot of of uh the film ginger snaps which also has two female characters in this case their sisters and we get to see that that two women together is going to be messy and it's going to sometimes be supportive and sometimes destructive and it's it's funny but it's also not funny because it's a very like serious subject um and i think there's there's a beautiful space in here that leads us into camp right like i i think this film's greatest strength 
and 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 so too of, of ginger snaps is is really its ability to say we know it's been out there we are intimately familiar with this genre we're going to be super aware of it in this satirical way that you may not always laugh out loud but you're gonna like chuckle as you remember things uh you know like at the next day because we understand that that the liminal space or or camp right is where the magic happens is this a comedy or is this a horror film yes is this a terrible film or a great film yes yes right? absolutely it's because the yeah because camp the camp aesthetic is just over every single aspect of it i think that's why it's so tricky to define it into one specific genre yes. because i feel the most appropriate defined descriptor of this film is that camp and for anyone who knew maybe doesn't know uh a ton about the definition of camp uh listen back for a more detailed discussion in our evil dead episodes particularly evil dead 2 we go we do a full examination of susan sontag's seminal essay over camp but to kind of just describe it in like a really short addendum form for this episode again camp is basically just the heightening of things to an excess. It just it does not it does not factor in any like objective good excess or bad excess. It just is to a to a large degree. I mean, and that this film takes the very standard plot line of like high school thing, demon storyline and it just turns it up to an 11. To quote to quote another satire. Yeah, another campy film. <laughs> another campy popular. satire. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a lovely definition. Um, and for those of you that are still like, but what does this mean? I love the fact that, you know, the concept of something that's campy works really well for understanding if you did go to summer camp, right? Yes. Um, because like uh -huh. everything at summer camp, you're like, so I spent half my morning learning archery, a skill I'll never need. And then we went horseback riding and then we had a, a color war. What is happening? Right? Like, there's just, you know, like the summer camp concept of, of just that word excess, right? Um, yeah, so heightening deep. everything. Yes. For, for seemingly no reason. Like, that, yes. which is the, the reason I think is why it applies to Jennifer's body is you could have easily done this story in a more uh, conventional sense. Like, I a lot of this store idea, like the of a possessed, cheerleader killing cla male classmates. You could have done that in a really like conventional fashion and it would have and worked. And we've seen those, and it, right? Exactly. Um, you know, I spit on your grave or any of the, as you mentioned earlier, the revenge rape um, or rape revenge uh, films. Exactly. Right? Those are doing them straight up and there is very little, if any, camp in those films, right? But this is a film that has the pinnacle moment be at prom. Prom yeah. is a really good example of camp. Right? Because we make such a to-do about it. Um, and I think Needy's costuming choices, you know, that like pink taffeta dress and her hair is like the biggest it's ever been. And you're like, I'm not even sure what decade we're in all of a sudden. That is a moment where it is clear because they made decisions in terms of costuming and makeup where you knew they, you know they were aware of, that they were playing with camp, right? Because they made it ridiculous. They made it over the top. Sontag says that... The thing about camp is, she's like, is it good or is it bad? And she's like, does that even really, is that even a question we need to answer, right? Like, camp is not good or bad, camp is camp. And I feel like that, Jennifer's body is not good or bad. Jennifer's body is not feminism, feminist or non-feminist. Jennifer's body just says Jennifer's body. Yeah. Unapologetically so. And, and there are some really sophisticated things that are happening as a result in the film. Mm-hmm. I think that the dy I, that dynamic that it gets to explore between uh, Needy and Jennifer is is a really fascinating dynamic, and it gets into this idea that Cody talks about when the inspiration for the film that the monstrous is always feminine, and she was like, and feminine in this case can be things like puberty, the growing up, the friendships, the female friendships that you have can be monstrous and she talks about in horror like in the horror genre we're so used to feminine and monstrous this is a it's a it's very commonplace in here and she wanted to explore that same idea in a different way and i think it's kind of fun it's really it's a f interesting dynamic to get to frame your entire movie around 
It really is. And and I think what what I appreciate about her investigation of the monstrous feminine is that by the end of the film, Needy is also um, by this definition, right? A monster, right? She's mm-hmm. become a demon. And and we should remember, right? So 2009 is, is when this film is coming out. So yep. 2004 is when films like Mean Girls came out. Yep. Um, the 80s is when Heathers came out. And, and those films, through less obvious horror means, um, are, are basically saying all teenage girls have the potential to be monsters um, because puberty is no joke. Because little girls are no more um, delicate and precious than, uh, you know, anyone else. Because femininity can be about eating people just as much as about, you know, giving birth to people. Yeah, and I mean, the, a lot, they do this exact exchange. Like, Needy tells Chip that Jennifer is evil. And Chip, he's like, I know. And she's like, no, I mean, she's actually evil. Not high school evil. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, I think that this film just kind of, like, knows how to play with that. And I think by making Needy at the end, by not giving us that happy ending, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Needy saves Jennifer. She kills her best friend. And yeah. we've, we've talked in previous episodes about um, how how problematic slasher films are in that they, they set up these final girls who by the end of the film have, have killed themselves, have done all of the things that we have said the monster does, but they're somehow still delicate and precious and feminine. Right. 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 Um, and this film says, no, no, no. If you fight a monster... You will walk out a monster. This is like the retelling of Beowulf, right? Um, yeah. You, 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 you are as much a monster. It's just that you're the story is being told with you as the hero. That's a lot to pack into what is not actually that long of a film. Um, yeah. As a message. Needy is certainly an interesting final girl. And my understanding of final girls will ever be reshaped by since I read the final girl support group. Which a great, great book. Yeah, and you still need to read it, so no spoilers. Uh, no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers, but they explore similar ideas of that this final girl is closer to the monster than perhaps we give them credit for. And and this one, I re- it is a really fun thing that you can't put... Ev- this film kind of, as most camp does, as we talked about with Evil Dead 2 and all these campy films, they reject a lot of binaries. And this film has a really clear opportunity to position Jennifer and Needy as binaries. In fact, it does so. And it right? it initially does that. Or or I should say, it makes you think that's what the film is doing. Right. They have a blonde and a brunette. There's even that line about like how um, Needy is allowed to wear certain types of clothing to accentuate certain body parts because Jennifer is allowed to accentuate other body parts. Right. So so it sets up. You're like, okay, good girl wild girl, smart girl, you know, I mean, it really, it makes you think that all of these binaries are being created and, and it's like, wow. And it even, even within those binaries is offering things that are kind of subversive to even some of the things in the status quo, like the blonde in this subgenre of female high school films is usually coded as the, they're the scandalous leader one, yes. but that's reversed in this one. Then in this one, we have the brute. Brunette. So you're like, oh, they're already even within this binary that they're doing. And that's just one example of many that this yes. film does. Even within this binary that they are supposedly establishing, you are subverting things, which is that just shows the layers that this film has. <laughs> and there's there's one scene that I think illustrates how clever this film is at its most clever moments. So again, I don't think this is a film that is is anywhere close to perfect i don't think you think that either and i don't think it uh, perfect I, is such a it, boring yeah, way to evaluate a film like um, this i think so i think there are prob- there's there are aspects of this film that i have serious concerns or problems with however when this film is on i think it's on in a way that is is just rather um awe-inspiring and the scene that i think perfectly illustrates everything you're saying is the parallel editing between Needy having sex with her boyfriend yes. and Jennifer eating the emo in the, the house. Okay, so so it sets it up as being two, again, binaries. We have an empty house versus, uh, you know, a, a well-beloved bedroom of a boy. We have um, this random, quote, hookup versus, you know, a loving relationship. Um, 
you know, one is has been sexified uh, so that even though we don't see anything uh, of Jennifer eating the emo, it's still, you know, it's very sort of scintillating, right, in terms of the shadows and stuff. And the other is just awkward. Um, yeah. But the, the, as we continue on with the film, right, we realize that, that both of them are getting things out of that relationship that are independent of what the, the male characters think is happening. One of my favorite lines, and I can't remember, I can't even remember the boyfriend's name, Chip. Chip, Chip right? that's right, yeah. <laughs> he has this line that he says something like, and I'm not just saying this because of the sex that we had for four minutes or something like that. It's just such a perfect line because... You know, Chip is, he's kind of a douche. Yeah. You know, like, he's not a good guy. He's certainly not my favorite guy. Um, my favorite guy is is the emo character in part because that actor has been playing a teenager for like 20 years. And so that just always cracks me up. But Chip is is not actually perfect boyfriend material. He gets easily persuaded by, by Jennifer. Um, he doesn't listen to his girlfriend who's like, something is wrong. And this film shows us, right, that what seems on the surface to be the, this perfect binary of the perfect loving high school relationship and a casual hookup, really, at the end of the day, both are not great, right? And both are sort of broken. The dichotomy of it is just brilliant, but the pain in both is really felt. It's a, yes. you're like, they are, they set up to be opposites. And yet, in many ways, they just yes. overlap, and you're like, "Wow, I guess that. Uh, yes. I guess things aren't as simple as I once thought they were." I know, <laughs> because there's that moment, which again, I don't know if I, I don't know if this was the first time that I picked up on it, or if I have chuckled every time, but um, where Chip mistakes Needy, who's having like a panic attack, right? She's having like a horror demon infused panic attack he mistakes that for her having an orgasm and so we have that versus uh what is clearly not a pleasurable experience for the emo gentleman um as megan's eating his innards but there's just like you said you take a step back and you're like oh this is way way deeper than than just the surface story of you know good girl bad girl um, and I think it makes the kiss that they share later on all the more interesting because we've already seen this character engage in kissing and needy in this context. But then when you see it in another context, you see it for the first time be able to be without pain. It's sexual scenario, the same, a lot, not the exact same thing, but similar situation. And yet it's not painful when it's with this person who is supposedly monstrous. And yet it is painful, not because she's a, a monster as in a demon, but because Jennifer is has always been a user, right, um, of Needy in particular. And Needy has that sort of epiphany of like, sometimes I want to play with the pretty doll, right? Sometimes I get to be, be the first one to pick. And so even as it's as it's in many ways the one of the healthier uh, physical intimacy moments in the film, it's still it's still a really problematic relationship. Oh, for sure. There, well, yeah. While it may sexually be at least, at least they're on the same page, which is better than any other sexual relationship we see in the film. Emotionally, it is super bad. <laughs> it is, and uh, and to me, honest, that scene, and as well as the scene when Jennifer, you know, swims across the lake and you know gets out of the water, I, I think that those scenes could have been been really critical and pivotal parts of the film moments that really allowed us as, as viewers to think explicitly about the the male gaze but i don't think that's why they're in there right they read as being in there because that's what they needed to put in there to sell a film to to their intended demographic and whether or not that's true maybe uh cody and Kus kusama and they will tell you right they will yeah. tell you they had other reasons for putting them in there but to me the sophistication of so many of the other scenes and the lack of sophistication with those two scenes suggests that there are moments in here that they just kind of said, okay, well, this is what's expected of us. And we've seen this before from other horror filmmakers who have been told, we want to see more X or we wish there was Y. Ari and then, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to you, Ari We are Aster. talking explicitly about the end of Hereditary, which... Uh... Yeah, that I, and I think that, you know... Again, I would be very curious to see if, if A24 let Cody and Kusama make Jennifer's body. Um, it would just be such a wildly different beast. And I think yeah. it would be so 
maybe not in as good of ways because you it wouldn't have the messiness the same messiness as the cult classic but i just i do think there are some scenes that read to me no matter how much they put a spin on it as not doing the things that that they have said as auteurs that they are trying to do and this is why i don't think we should ever listen to the author right yeah I'll, I'll, anecdotally though I was in a room I watched it with a room full of uh, queers a lot of lesbians and they were the target demographics for those scenes that you were talking about in a different way than uh, perhaps they were even trying to market because the marketing was skewed at teenage boys and I think the market may have been right for this film horny people but I think they just got it wrong it's a perhaps horny lesbians instead of I, uh... I will say <laughs> that yes um, this is a, a film that, that my partner definitely, uh, is more behind those scenes, right? Um, as a general rule. And, and so, but for me, if, if I'd known, if Cody and Kusama had said, lesbians, this one's for you, wink, <laughs> I would have been like, that would have been like rocket. I just feel like, again, that they're, they were unfairly burdened, mm-hmm. um, with just what we have said. Yeah. A horror film needs to be. Um, yeah. And so I would like to see Cody and Kusama be granted either Blumhouse or A24, both of, of whom, you know, are pretty much like do it in terms yeah. of horror now to just like give them, you know, the, the blank check and say, what is your next? What is Jennifer's body part two look like? Even if it's not the same characters, what is the next film that has the same aesthetic? Yeah. I just think it would rock our worlds. I, I think so too. I don't now. I, this, uh, this film as an artifact and as an aesthetic of camp is already good on its own, so I don't necessarily know if I would be interested in seeing the same thing just done again, but like a continuation or a new, or better yet, yeah, I a wouldn't new want to thing see a from these people, from these authors in uh, Cody and Kusame, who both are, admittedly, they are, they've still been working, They're, they've done a lot, they haven't worked together again, uh, Cody in particular has been Doing, no, they've done, been writing quite a bit, writing, directing, producing all over the place. Uh, Kusame to a lesser extent, but I would love to see them come back and work together on something new. Maybe yeah, I think now I should they clarify could... not a remake, right? Like yeah, I want to clarify no. that was not what I was saying. I, I think <laughs> that the best thing they could do is just give them permission to make it like you can make it as explicitly queer as you want. Like you don't have to, you don't have to like adhere to some kind of like moral policing which you can kind of feel i think is why like even in those scenes like if you read it from a queer perspective they don't it doesn't entirely work as anything other than largely like queer baiting uh the whole movie you can if you're now i not to say that it is not a queer film and that the again i watched it with a bunch of right it's (sighs) very similar to to nightmare on elm street 2 right rocky horror yes where you know um the the ways in which it 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 validates the community may be independent of what's actually offered in the text absolutely and so not i don't want to discount it but i think it would be really interesting to see them be kind of unrestrained in a way that they kind of clearly were at least least in the marketing to some extent and not just the marketing but i you know i think about the two other films that i feel have similar vibes to Jennifer's body in the best way possible. And that's the original Black Christmas and Ginger Snaps, both of which are Canadian films. So it's not just the marketing. It's also how American horror has been constructed um, traditionally and how, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, even for a film that is like, like a film like Mean Girls, which you would think with the target audience would be, you know, teenage girls, there's still this way in which it has to be created through the male gaze, right? We got to make sure we have pretty girls. We got to have, you know, I mean, there's just so much of this film that is the the product of, of a culture that is not ready for or able to comprehend the majesty of, I, I'm not really sure, um, of Jennifer's body. And like you said, the other thing that makes this film what it is, is that camp, camp is sort of oftentimes very, it's a very liminal um contained experience again think about summer camp right like it's just that summer and it's and then it's done and it was it's even more beautiful for having been to this this like really limited thing and I, I think that jennifer's body part of what makes it so so valuable is that it was this film right that was created that has since been reappropriated and it's a film that that 
isn't going to have sequels because <laughs> because it wasn't popular enough no. to have them. And, and so there's just so much about it that, like you said, um, really sets it up nicely. The mythos is almost as interesting as the actual film itself. Yes. And the conversations that at least we, I, I've gotten to have about it with you, with people who I've watched it with, with strangers, is certainly worth it. So Jennifer's body, pretty good. <laughs> In this respect, right, yeah. it, it joins the leagues of, of um, films in terms of, like you said, the interest about not just the text, but conversations around the text of, of things like other cult classics, Evil Dead and Nightmare on Elm Street. It's just that we get to also now have a film that, um, regardless of whether it's feminist, regardless of whether or not it's, it's enough of a feminist text, whatever that means, is a film that is by females, about females looking at the complexity of females and just how cool is that thank you so much for joining us for this episode of jennifer's body we decided to include this film right now because it's kind of having yet another sort of resurgence i think it particularly um as megan fox has been promoting some of her other horror films you know she's made it very clear that she's really attached to jennifer's body and so we think this is a film that's very timely. Even some music artists have been referencing Jennifer's body in like the music videos recently. It's coming back. Yeah, it's Jennifer's it is. body is back. It is <laughs> in back. a big way. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to hear your thoughts about it. Um, you can write them down in the comments below if you're listening on YouTube. You can contact us via our social media because we try to be fairly active on there. We have several different platforms. Anthony, what am I missing? I, our, what our next episode is on? So our our next film is 1994's New Nightmare. So get ready, get excited for that. If you haven't seen that one, check it out so that you can be up to date for our discussion. And thanks so much for listening. Have a spectacular day. <laughs>